comfortable. You know, I've told you this before, the enemy doesn't care if you come to church. He does not care. He sometimes comes too. And so, you know, he doesn't care if you even call yourself a Christian. In fact, he loves it if you call yourself a Christian and don't act like one. I mean, that's his favorite. He's like, yeah, please do. Make a mockery of the name of Christ. Um, so, it's not about whether we show up to church. That doesn't make Satan uncomfortable. What makes him uncomfortable is when anybody gathers, even two people that gather for the sole purpose of, of glorifying or at least making their conversation. You may have close friends that you spend time talking to. And when you get together and talk about something other than just your own life and what's happening, but when you begin to talk to each other about who God is in your life, what is his activity in your life, when you start talking to each other about challenging one another to grow in Christ, woo, the enemy don't like that. He says, I don't care if you all gather all the time. Just don't gather in the name of Jesus. That's what he doesn't like. But when two or three come through those doors, and obviously at least two or three of you have gathered here this morning because you're here to meet with the Lord. You're here because of Him. Not because somebody told you to come, not because you have to be here, not because I have to be here. Yeah, not because of that, right? But because we, we came because of Jesus. The prompting of Him, the meeting with Him, and when that happens, the enemy's like, well, what can I mess with? Well, technology is one of the greatest areas that the enemy will mess with. Um, but there's other things, too, you know, that he can try to get in and try to mess. But I was thinking about this. You know, we always say God is more powerful than Satan. And, and he is, no question, more powerful. But let me help you understand the power of God versus the power of anybody, us or Satan. Either way. Really, the term is not that God is more powerful, but that God is all-powerful. And there's a difference between those phrases. Because if I say that God is more powerful than me, then I'm saying that I have a degree of power of my own. Are you tracking with me? So when I say that he has all the power, that means even whatever ounce or amounts of whatever power I think I might have... I only have as a result of his power. He is in charge of all power in the world. Even the power you think you have, and you go, yeah, well, it works, and I know I have power. You do. You actually have some power. You have free will um, to choose, uh, to come, to go, to believe, to not believe, to have an attitude, to not have an attitude, to lie, to be honest. You have the power within you. But you need to understand something. It's one of the reasons why people don't like death. Because death, when death comes about, or when death is imminent, what we don't like is, is that that's something we have absolutely no power over. And so we're faced with that. Because the reality is, no matter how much power which we do have, what you have to always remember is that is only power in as much as he has given it to you. He gave it to you, and he can take it from you. And that's the thing we have to realize. So even when we think of the enemy trying to discourage us and defeat us, and we go, God, I know you have more power than the enemy. What you have to sit and meditate on is that I don't know that you have more power. I know that you have all power over everything in my life, including the things that come in. So I just want to encourage you this morning that when you are feeling under attack, and when I say you, I'm talking about people who are um, walking in relationship with Jesus Christ. You've given your life to Christ, and as best that you can, you are trying to follow him. And when you're doing that, you are going to suffer some trials along the way. It's like the, uh, the song Kayla is saying, trading my sorrows. Pr crushed but not destroyed, uh, persecuted, not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed, and so goes something like that. And so that's quoting scriptures. That's Paul talking. And so um, when we are feeling that, which you're going to, because when you follow Jesus, you're not following the world, and you are going against the norm. We've been talking for several weeks about this kingdom of God, this kingdom of heaven that's here on earth. And if you live in the kingdom of heaven, and you're sitting here and you're going, I never suffer with any persecution, you ain't living in the kingdom. 
I don't know where you're living, but it ain't in the kingdom. Because the kingdom of God operates different than the world. The kingdom of God doesn't follow the same rules that the world does. But the truth of the matter is, you guys have to know that the majority of the population in the world is following the world's ways of thinking, which essentially is following the prince of this world, the devil. And so since the majority, and, and we're like that, we're creatures of habit to go and do what everybody else is doing. It's very, I did this thing when I was a children's pastor, and I've done it with <coughs> teens, and I did it with my, my class, or it was so funny, it works every time. I should do it to you all sometime, maybe, not tell you the story, but anyway. Mm -hmm. So, but you, you, all the kids are in the, in the Sunday school, we're all sitting here, and so I did this experiment, this, this kid went to the bathroom, and I said, okay, now everybody, lay down on the floor. Just lay down like you're laying, like you're sleeping, just lay down on the floor. And when Johnny comes back in, don't anybody say anything to him. Don't, and he's going to ask, maybe. But just watch and see what happens. <laughs> so they did. They all got on the floor. And Johnny walks back in. And he's like, what are you guys doing? Of course, he just kind of sits there because nobody's talking. So he knows it's quiet. So he's quiet. Why is he quiet? Because they're quiet. Slowly but surely, Johnny's like, <laughs> lays down on the floor we're like okay object lesson done he's like what what are we doing we just were proving that you would do exactly what we're doing <laughs> works every time because we're creatures of habit we do what everybody else does right notice how the majority we we all tend to sit where more people sit we're just we're creatures of going with the flow right if everybody's going in that line it must be the right line <laughs> you ever see me at a store and I'm headed to a line, do not go where I go. It's been proven, you can ask my family. I will, I mean, it could be one person with one item, everybody else is in that line, and I'm like, this seems like the best line. Light goes on, the manager's being called. Unbelievable! I always pick the wrong line, but we are creatures of habit. So in the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven doesn't operate the way the rest of the world operates. We forgive even when the person is not forgivable. We, we are to turn the other cheek. We don't strike back in anger. There's all sorts of things that we do in the kingdom that we don't do in the world. And so it's very difficult. And so when you do that, you're going to suffer persecution. You're going to struggle with discouragement. Um, the world looks at each other, and we judge ourselves by each other. That's not how it is in the kingdom. We all, we're going to look at that today. We're going to look at the common meal and how it brings us all together and levels the playing field. You know, we're constantly, I'm better than that person. This person's better. I'm not as bad as that person. I mean, I've always said, don't you wish you could pick one person to take with you at Judgment Day? <laughs> Y'all just thought of who you're going to take, right? <laughs> hey, Johnny, come here. You're with me. Compared to him... I'm a priest, right? Right? Wouldn't that be great? But unfortunately, every single one of us will be measured up against the same person, Jesus Christ. And so it doesn't matter if you think you're really up here and this person's really down here. I hate to break it to you. Jesus kind of levels that out. And he says that we all miss the mark. That scripture in Romans says we all fall short of God's glory. We all fall short of God's favor. Yet in his grace, he bestows favor on us by giving us Jesus. Not because of our merit and our worth, but because of Christ's merit and his worth in us. So he levels that out. In the kingdom of God, we understand, we don't compare ourselves with each other, that we are brought together under one name. Jesus Christ. So it is they, kingdom residents, that we see in Acts, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. This is, a lot of times you might hear, especially if you're not a church-going person, but you might hear, oh, they're an Acts 242 church. And that's a very common phrase. You might even hear ministries called Acts 242. It's a very common scripture because this essentially is one of the very first scriptures that we see 
of the New Testament church, right after Jesus has ascended into heaven, the Holy Spirit has now been set free to uh, take residence in our lives and lead and direct us. How can we do those things I was telling you before? Through the power of the living God, the Holy Spirit that, that resides in us. And it is they, they came to that belief, and they just became consumed with kingdom living. They were just consumed with this new truth that it wasn't about them, but it was totally about Jesus Christ, and, and, and the church just exploded. At the same time the church was exploding, so was great persecution. These people were being killed and martyred for Jesus all the time. Some of us, it's like, it's too hard to read my Bible. <laughs> Isn't it though? In, third, in countries where people read their Bible, to even be holding a Bible would get them executed. Some of us have three Bibles in our house, right? So they were devoted. Man, listen to that rain. That's cool. Not thank you, Jesus, for the rain. Right? They devoted themselves to, to the apostles' teachings. What does that mean? To God's teachings. We looked at that last week. I, I want you to know, those of you that have responded and asked, asked for prayer, we've been praying for you this week that you are, are being more devoted. But also they were devoted to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. Essentially, that's communion and prayer. That's communion and prayer, the breaking of bread. You know, we're so, I can't imagine what the first communion looked like after Jesus ascended. After they started to gather together, these people just gathered together. They had no clue what they were doing. They just had, they just knew that they came together in the name of Jesus. They came together and they said, let's just hear more about him. We just want to learn more about his teachings. We're hungry for that. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for God's right way of living. Some of us are like, please don't tell me ignorance is bliss. There should be a verse in there, right? <laughs> There is a verse about ignorance, but you probably wouldn't like it. Right? But they were just devoted to coming together to participate in that common meal that they would share together. It wasn't like, oh, here's a wafer and here's a juice. And, you know, it, no, it was just they gathered around. I mean, wine, unfortunately, today we don't use wine. And the only reason we don't use wine is because of so many people that struggle with the addiction of alcohol. And so most Protestant churches leave alcohol out. But in that day, alcohol was a very common drink. In fact, it was necessary because it would help to purify the water. Because the water would make them sick. And so they, that's a, how some of you drink rock star. <laughs> no. But I mean, whatever your drink is, that's what they drank. And it wasn't quite fermented the way it is today. So no, your kids aren't running around with a buzz. You know? Um, and so it was very common at the meal. And where we are such gorged on food... America, we, we're fat. <laughs> okay, so we, we have too much food. We're consumed with eating and eating and eating and eating. And, and so, whereas theirs, the common meal was the meal that brought everybody together. And they would sit together, and they would share together, and they would eat together. And for the New Testament church, um, bread really meant something in the New Testament church. Going all the way back to the Israelites and the manna from heaven, that bread that came from heaven, and then Jesus saying that I am that bread. And so now this bread and this common meal that we gather together so that we can eat and consume and be satisfied, we do that together. It's so much better to be satisfied with the Lord in community than alone. I have experienced, as I've told you, Many times where I get lonely in following Jesus. Because so many people are always about other things. I mean, they have Jesus moments, but in reality, their life is just about their life. And when your life is totally just about Jesus and you're consumed with that, when you find someone else who's consumed with that, it's like energizing. So they would come together for that common meal and share together. They devoted themselves to this communion and prayer. Well, what is communion? A lot of us have different ideas about what communion is. Why do we participate in this ritual of eating these wafers and juice? What does it mean to even be devoted to such a memorial? 
I wonder how many of us come forward every Sunday. We're doing communion a little different today because that's what we're talking about. But every Sunday we come to take the elements. And I wonder how many of us even think about what this ritual means. Are you just practicing a ritual because you have to? I was raised in the Catholic Church. I know what that's like. I mean, you just, I could go to a mass right now and boom, 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 boom. I could follow the liturgy and not miss a beat. Well, that's because for 18 years I did that. I know when to kneel, I know how to respond, I know all those things. But if you would have asked me as a child, what does this mean? I'd be like, oh. You know, I just practice the ritual. And uh, without knowing why you practice the ritual, the ritual becomes very powerless. It doesn't really serve the purpose. Um, so I wonder if we are simply, and, and I also wonder how many of us are simply devoted to taking the wafer and the juice. And the reality is, can I just be honest with you? Some of you shouldn't be taking it. We're going to look at that at the end. You should not be taking something that has been consecrated to the Lord. It means it's dedicated to the Lord. This no longer is just Greek pita bread. You're like, oh, sweet, I didn't have breakfast this morning. Get a lovely snack. Um, go to McDonald's on your way home. But this is not that. <laughs> We did communion a couple weeks ago, you know, we had like all the families taking communion together. I think it was my grandson who tried to take two or three. I said, Roman, it's not a snack. Move it along, right? Because kids are like, sweet, I love those. It's delicious. I have a Snickers to wash it down, right? So we don't always know what this ritual really means. But it was the night before <coughs> Jesus was to be crucified that he gathered his disciples around a table around a very important meal. And I put scriptures up at different times for you guys just to help you know. And the meal was the Passover meal. And he said, make preparations. And he gathered the disciples. This is the night before he was going to be crucified. Very important night. The night that he's kind of bringing it all together for them, yet the disciples were still very confused by everything that was happening. But it was the night before, and he gathers his disciples around this really important memorial meal. Now, the disciples weren't confused by the meal. It was Passover week. It was the night to be participating in the Passover, <coughs> to, be, to begin to prepare for the Passover. Jesus said to them in Luke, I love this verse, I think I put it up. I love that it says, I eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And if you know what the Passover means, you know how powerful that he, to say, I eagerly desired. What he's saying is, I eagerly desired to share in this moment, because Jesus knows what he's talking about, and the disciples don't. We do because we have the Bible. We may not read it, but we do have it. See, it had been over 400 years uh, that God's chosen people I'm going to rewind thousands of years. It had been actually, I believe, 430 years, and God's chosen people, the Israelites, had been enslaved, kind of been trapped into the nation of Egypt. So now they were a people, they were Israelites, but they were owned by Egypt. And if you want to know how they became owned by Egypt, Write that down on a card and I'll meet with you after church. But they found themselves in this situation and the oppression was great. And the reason why it was so great is Egypt was very hard. The Egyptians were very hard on the Israelites because there were really probably more Israelites than there were Egyptians. And boy, if the Israelites figured that out for half a minute, they might just have an uprising on their hands. So they really kept them down. In fact, there was a point where Pharaoh even instructed the midwives that as the Hebrew women, the Israelite women, were giving birth, should any boys be born, kill them before they come out. Because, of course, boys will grow up to be in the army, so we want to take care of them. It is that is the reason it's so special that Moses ended up being saved in that process, because he was one of those Hebrew baby boys. But here they had been enslaved, they were in bondage to Egypt, um, which means they had to live and eat and behave the way the Egyptians did. God's people, we're talking now about the people of the family of Abraham. Abraham 
is the one who received the promise. If you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 11, you will see where God calls Abraham to become a great nation. It is the people of Abraham who I'm talking about. Abraham, who had received the promise from the creator of the universe that his people, that Abraham's people would be a chosen race, a chosen people, that the whole world will come to know God and be blessed by God through these people. What you, let me use terminology, it helps you a little bit, the Jewish people. When I say Israelites, I'm talking about Jewish people. God's precious, that's what God called them, his precious Possession. You will be my people. I will be your God. And all nations will come to know me through you. It's how God wants people to become Christ's followers. Do you know his number one mission, what he uses to accomplish people coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ is Christ's followers. You are his mission plan. He, his desire is that when people look at you, that they would want to see him. That's the plan. And he said, you'll be my people, and I will be your God. Many of you know the story of the Exodus. It's a book in the Bible. It's the second book of the Bible. And if you wonder what, what Exodus means, it's the exit, E-X-I-T, really, the Exodus. They're leaving Egypt. Right? They're leaving Egypt. Uh, you've probably seen a cartoon. I'm pretty sure there's a cartoon that, that talks about that. Is not the Prince of Egypt. Right? There you go. I'm like, oh, okay. See, I love it. Nobody knows the Bible, but Prince of Egypt. We're good. You got that? It's a cartoon. So you've probably seen it. I should put clips of the cartoon up there, right? And so many of you know the story of the Exodus and that a baby was born, Moses, to be a deliverer and to set God's people free from Egypt. And so the story of the Passover is in the Exodus. The Passover essentially happens on the, uh, the ninth of the tenth plague. God sends plagues into the nation of Egypt, guided by Mo you know, Moses, guided by God, directs these people. Uh, the water turns um, to blood. Um, the Nile becomes blood. And all these different plagues that take place, um, locusts, frogs, gnats, all types of different things that affect every part of Egypt. And Pharaoh, is heart is hardened and will not let God's people go until this last plague. And the last plague is the plague of the firstborn. And if you want to spend time reading that, it's in Exodus 11 and 12. And we see the, the story of the Passover. And I'll just paraphrase it for you. What happens that night is that God instructs Moses and then Moses tells the people his people, this is what's going to happen tonight. But the angel of the Lord will pass through all of Egypt, and every firstborn son, beginning with the son of Pharaoh, all the way down to the slave girl and her son, will be struck dead tonight. And only those who have the blood of the lamb that will be slain, and put the uh, blood on the doorpost, I think I have a picture of it, there we go, and just an interesting side note, they actually use hyssop plant. Moses tells them, take a hyssop plant, dip it in the blood, and put it on the door frames and the sides of your houses. And it had to be a very particular lamb. In fact, God said, what I want you to do is go out and get this lamb without blemish. And if you're a small, maybe you're just a husband and wife, you need to bring in other people and, and meet together. And you need to slaughter the lamb. Take the blood, put it in the basin, and put it on the doors. Then you are to cook the lamb, and you are to eat the lamb. Anything that's not eaten is to be burned, because it is sacred unto God that night. And so when the blood is on the door, and the angel of the Lord goes through the night, through Egypt, he will pass over the doors that have the blood of the lamb, sparing God's people from his wrath. So the only thing that protected the Israelites that night was what? The blood of the lamb. It saved them. And it, it's after that that Pharaoh says to Moses, of course, 
because he's lost his son. Go. Get out of here. And so essentially, all of Israel was set free on that night. And they began the journey of a life lived without being in bondage to Egypt anymore. And so salvation came through the blood of the Lamb for them that night. In Exodus 12, 14, it says, God said, this is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. So this is the meal. This is, it, hopefully you understand what this is. To commemorate is to serve as a memorial, as a reminder. In other words, God instructed them. When your children ask why you're doing this, you're to tell them about what happened in Egypt. You are to remind them that the blood of the Lamb has set them free. That God saved them from this bondage. And so every year, the same time that we celebrate Easter, is the time that the Jewish community to this day still celebrate Passover. Because it's been told as a lasting ordinance, a command, not a suggestion, but a command of God that you are to remember this memorial every year, what God has done for you. So, it is this festival that Jesus was commemorating the night before his death. This is that memorial meal of the Passover. And it was this meal that Jesus is sitting there at this table. The only difference is, there's not really a lamb there, but there is. That's why I said I eagerly desired to share in this meal with you. And the disciples still, even though Jesus had told them several times, probably in the last few weeks, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to die, and I'm going to rise three days later. And then the disciples go, I don't get it. And he says, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to die, and three days later I'm going to, okay, still don't get it. Even when he rose from the dead, the disciples said, I don't get it. Oh my gosh, are you the densest group of people? This is our Christians today, right? <laughs> so it is this meal that Jesus was instituting a new memorial meal. See, because Jesus was going to be that lamb, and he knew that. And he knew that the memorial that they're practicing, they will be practicing no more. There will be no more sacrificing of animals. There will be no more shedding of blood. He knew that he was going to be the final sacrifice, the lamb of God. Jesus is now our Passover lamb that takes away the sin of our life, that sets us free from the bondage of a life lived in sin. I don't know if you've caught it yet, but let me help you in case you haven't. Egypt is the sin that we find ourselves in bondage to. It's all those things that you say, I can't do this. It's because you're in bondage to it. You actually have more power. Going back to that. You actually have the power to reach out and take from the tree of life and no longer live in chain to, to, being, to running your life your own way. That's what sin is. What do we need to be saved from? Well, we need to be saved because long before there was an Adam and Eve who said, I don't want, I want to be in charge of my own life. I want to do things my way. That's sin, my friends. You may be sitting here going, I don't lie, I don't cheat, I don't steal, I don't cuss, I don't smoke, I don't chew, I don't go with girls that do. I think that's how it goes. Right? Okay, so. That's what my first pastor was. A little thing he used to always say. It's very cute. I'm thinking, what about guys? And so, right? You may say you don't do all those things, but that's sin behavior. Why you do the things you do is your sin nature. And the only thing that can save you from that internal sin nature, the nature that, that resists God, that resist having somebody else tell me what to do. I want to live my life for myself. And many of us are in absolute bondage to that. Right? Some of us are in absolute bondage to our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions. And it's wreaking havoc in your life. It's, think about it. When you act out and do something you shouldn't do, it's like, what, and what do you say when you say, I'm sorry? I'm sorry, but it's really, really bad. Okay. Well, it still hurt what you did, right? So, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry I hit you, but you, I, or I, I'm sorry I 
lie, but I didn't have any choice because if I, if I tell the truth, you're not going to like me, you're not going to love me. And, and all of that, we trace it back to a thought, a feeling, an emotion, a thought, a feeling, an emotion that causes us to behave a certain way. In other scripture in Corinthians, it says, take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. I've gone over this for the last couple weeks on Wednesday night with some people. What does that mean? It means take every thought captive. Can I let some of you in on a secret that maybe you haven't heard? You actually have dominion and power over your thoughts and your feelings and your emotions. So start taking power and dominion over your thoughts, feelings, and emotions. Stop letting them run your life. Amen. Stop letting them run your life. Some of you, I mean, if you needed a word picture for it, you can sit back and watch some of you, and you have, you are, you've got like a collar around your neck and your hands, and you are just being drugged around by your feelings and your emotions, and you're just... And it's like, when the reality is, it's kind of like the Israelites in Egypt. If they would have got together and did a head count... If they would have got together and realized, wait a second, we have God. They have Pharaoh. And they probably would say something like, and our God's more powerful than Pharaoh. God's not more powerful than Pharaoh. God is all powerful over Pharaoh. Amen. And if they would have thought about that, right, wait, wait a second, we belong, we're God's chosen people. Why are we hiding out in the cave? Why are we doing all this stuff? There's more of us than that. We can actually take them. Right? But, but we, we don't realize that we become in bondage, enslaved to our feelings and our attitudes and our emotions and our thoughts. And we are in bondage just like they were in Egypt. And Jesus comes along and says, I want to set you free from that. So that you're not in bondage to what everybody else thinks. You're not in bondage to what the world says. But that you would be set free to walk with me who will not condemn, who will love you, who will show you grace, who will show you mercy, who will walk with you through the valley of the shadow of death, who will guard you when you're being persecuted, who will protect you, and who will love you in the end, because after all, can I tell you something? There's only one voice that's going to matter in your life when it's very important, and it's not the one in your head, and it's not the person you're trying to impress, please, or hate. It is God and God alone. He is, the, he is the only one whose opinion will matter for eternity. It is the only one. And to be set free from that, Egypt symbolizes the sin that we live in, and Exodus is our salvation. And the blood of the Lamb is what sets us free. Jesus took the bread. He broke it. And I'm sure the disciples didn't think anything of it. And it was probably bred something like this. Yeah, he didn't say, hey, England, where's the wafers? Make sure there's wafers and juice. But Jesus took the bread, and he begins to thank God for it. And then he breaks it in front of the disciples, which wouldn't have seemed like anything as he's breaking the bread. But he says to them, this bread... This is my body that is given for you. When you eat of it, remember me. In the same way, he took the, the drink that was from the table, would have been a cup of wine at that table, and he took the cup. And in the same way, he says, this cup holds the new covenant, the new promise in my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. I'm sure there was a lot of confusion at the table that night. Jesus often referred to himself as being the bread of life, and that, in fact, it wasn't too long before this that Jesus turned to all of these would-be followers and said, it's not food you're really looking for, what you're really missing in your life is me. So what you need to do is eat my flesh and drink my blood. And no, I'm not paraphrasing. 
And many of them said, that's a hard teaching. So they were familiar to Jesus referring to wine and blood, bread being the body, him being the wine and the bread, not fully understanding what they were talking about. I have to wonder if some of them are thinking, well, we're sharing in the Passover. Uh, what is he saying? What's happening here tonight? Well, it was later that same night that Jesus went away and he prayed. It's where he met with the Father. Many of you know this scripture because Jesus wept to the point of bleeding. But it is in that prayer, and if you really want to see even more of that prayer, you see that prayer in John 17. But he cries out. He cries out in sorrow for the mission, what this new covenant was going to be. It's in that prayer time that Jesus prayed for those who would believe. And, and that's the scripture I have up there. His prayer would be for those that believe in the promise, this new, new covenant, that we will be one with him. And, and let, me, let me specify this. He prayed that we would be one with the Father just as we are, they are one. Not similar, the same. In the same manner that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one, so does Jesus desire us to be one. Do you know the biggest um, struggle in Christianity today is that we are not one. We gather, we eat our own wafer and our own juice, and we go about with our own life, still consumed with our own life. And somehow we think a ritual is going to change that never realizing that we are taking from the same tray, drinking from the same cup, the same body, and the same blood. It brings us all together. We are all one in Christ. We are all lost without him, and we are all in need of him. And some of you say, well, she needs it more. And if that's even a thought in your head, let me tell you something, you need it more. They, those who receive the forgiveness of sins through the blood, those that put the Lamb's blood on the doorpost. You know, I have to believe that there were some Israelites that night that told Moses, really? Can't we just, can't we just eat it? I mean, does it really matter? I mean, how much blood are we talking? I'm sure there was some that says, does that have to be a lot of blood? You know, it's kind of like, it was like, how much do I have to give? How much do I have to? I mean, what's the bare minimum that I could just get in? Is there like a back door and get into heaven? <laughs> you gotta love that. It's like, yeah, there's just one door, people. I'm sorry. There really isn't a bare minimum. <laughs> right? But I have to believe that that night, that there were some that, that maybe questioned it. But they, those that received their forgiveness of sins, they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread and to prayer, that common meal I was telling you about. The kingdom of heaven residents are devoted. They give themselves, every part of themselves, to the communion of saints and the unity of prayer. Two big, big missing elements in the church today is prayer. We don't pray for one another. Every once in a while we do, but for the most part, and part of it is, you guys, is because we're just consumed with our own life. We're con so consumed, and where's this consumption? Let me take you all back. Some of you are still in bondage in Egypt. In other words, you're still consumed with your life, because after all, if you don't manage your life, who will? I'll tell you who will. The one you give it to. The one you give it to. And some of you are giving it to the enemy when you give it to your mind, your thoughts, your emotions. Or you give it to Jesus Christ and let him worry about it. Kingdom residents give themselves to the communion of saints and to the unity of prayer. Why? Because it reminds them often what it means for every part of their life to be about Jesus. Everything about their life. We choose in our church to take communion every Sunday. And I've done that so that we are reminded of why we gather. That we are reminded of who Jesus is. 
That when we hear God's word, in, a, in, a, in just a short time here, I'm going to have you respond to what God says. And part of that response is taking in that communion. So we do that very intentionally. When we partake, when we participate, meaning when we, when in a few minutes, and we're going to pass this around, you're going to break it, and you're going to hand it to somebody. When we participate in the memorial meal of the body and blood of Jesus, when we gather together in his name, remember what I was talking about at the beginning? Many of us have come here for a variety of reasons. And I venture a guess that there might even be as many as half of you who have not come into this sanctuary because of Jesus. In fact, he has very little to do with your life. And that's fine. It's your life. You've been given the same amount of power that I've been given to choose life, to choose your own way. And you are free to choose that. There is no condemnation and there is no judgment in that. But those of us that come, when we gather together in his name, we are coming here because of him and him alone. That's what it means to come together. So when our conversations, when we're talking, when we're praying, when we're singing, when we're doing, we're here because of him and it brings us together. And we honor and remember him, what he's done to bring us together. This memorial meal reminds us. It's why, the, it's why that first church in Acts 2.42, I mean, they were just kind of like, they were all over when they first heard that message. But the one thing that, I always tell people all the time, first church is the most eclectic group of people you'll ever meet. And it's great. Because you know what brings us together? Jesus. We don't all work the same place. We don't all dress the same. We don't look the same. We don't make the same. We just... We're just, some of us have addiction, some of us don't. We have all different kinds of struggles, all different kinds of victories, all different kinds of joys. But the one thing that can tear this church apart real fast, it'll be real easy. Because the only thing that brings First Church together is the name of Jesus Christ. And when you stop being about Jesus Christ, you're going to look around and find that we're a squirrely bunch of people you don't want to be a part of. <laughs> right? So you just stop thinking about it. You're like, oh, I'm not hanging out with you anyways. You stink. Fine. <laughs> right? I don't like how you talk. I'm out of here. I don't like how she does that. I don't like how he does that. Fine. Oh, sure. Heck yeah. If you, if you need to take a moment, look around and be like, oh, the heck did I tell him here? Right? She's weird. I mean, okay, no even listening to her this long, right? James is already on his way out. He's like, I hadn't thought about this. I've been here for 20 years. When you stop thinking about Jesus, it's real easy to gather because of people. And if you're gathering because of people, you've got to find a reason to leave. Right? The memorial meal of communion reminds us that we are all one and we are not separate. We all are way more alike than we like to think. As we prepare here in a few moments to gather around this table, I want us to examine ourselves. Paul, when addressing the church, here's this new church. I mean, churches are just growing up. I mean, they just don't even know any better. I mean, they're just sprouting up in the name of Jesus. I mean, the church is just growing like wildfire. And here is this church in Corinth. You ever want to see what Christianity is like today? Read the book of Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. <laughs> That's the American church. <laughs> But Paul, when addressing the believers um, in Corinth and in his church, it, it, basically what was happening is the Christians who were gathering around that common meal, they actually called it the love feast. They would gather around the, the, the love feast, meaning God, because this is for God so loved the world, guys, that he gave us this. For God so loved the world and he saved us. And so there's this love feast that they would do. And what was happening is people were participating in this with little regard um, or no regard to what was happening. It's like I told you a little bit ago. Some of us take communion, and we probably shouldn't. I just want to encourage you. Um, and I don't know if encourage is the right word. I want to give you permission. It's okay for you to choose to not believe. That's, it is your right to do that. Until whenever such a time. My, my prayer is that one day you would receive but if you are sitting here today 
And you really don't buy into all this Christianity. Let's put it in terms you might understand. I'm not really into, I mean, yeah, there's some good stuff about God, but I got my own life and I don't need him. When I get to a place where I'm really needy like the rest of this group, right, then I will, you know, whatever it is that you say to yourself. I want to tell you something. Take this as nicely. You should not take communion. Because that is for those that believe. It's for those that remember what Christ has done in their life. And maybe Christ hasn't done that in your life yet. It doesn't mean he doesn't want to. In fact, he's talking to you right now. He's hoping that this message of salvation is drawing you out of that life of living life in your own terms and to be set free into a life with Jesus Christ so that one day you will live on, continue to live on, in the glorious paradise with the Father in heaven. And so he may be drawing you. But there's many people that will come to take the ritual of communion without any regard to their heart and what's going on. That's what was happening in the Corinthian church. In, in doing this, Paul, in his letter in Corinthians, implores them to examine their own hearts and attitudes and motives before coming before this meal. In fact, if you look in 1 Corinthians, and I think I might have put this verse up, so then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, <coughs> what I just explained to you guys is an unworthy manner, will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Jesus Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. This is a hard scripture, guys. It's hard. That's why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have passed on, is what that means, fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. In other words, examine your heart in truth. Some of you, can I tell you something? You lie to yourself. It's not others that's lying to you, it's you who lie to yourself. Be open with yourself. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we're being disciplined. Some of you right now are starting to examine your own life and you're thinking, gosh, you know, I have attitude, I'm still in bondage, I'm hanging out in Egypt, I'm still going back to my old way of living. I can't come up to this table when, when I'm still trying to do things this way. We don't have to come to this table because we've just figured everything out. We're so hyper-spiritually mature, we just can't stand ourselves. It's not that. God's doing a work in you. and Maybe he's revealing some things to you. Maybe he's been revealing some things to you that you're holding on to for dear life. You know, some of you would say, I would hate the shackles and this. You, you, you really want to know what it's like. Read all of Exodus. People were so happy to be set free. Said, yeah, we're out of here. We hate you Egyptians. Woo! Right? They get about a mile out and they're like, you packed us food, right, Moses? <laughs> oh, no, I forgot. <laughs> okay? Well, now we're at the Red Sea. Oh, great, now we're going to die. So you brought us out here to die. But they were the most grumbling bunch of people. And every time God would do something, as if the Passover wasn't mind-blowing enough, I think the Red Sea is pretty incredible. I don't know about you, but that seems pretty powerful. Quite a phenomenon. I mean, they even went through on dry land. They get through the dry land, and they complain. Forgetting what happened in the Red Sea, forgetting what happened at the Passover, forgetting the nine plagues, forgetting all those things. They get through the Red Sea, yoo we love you, Jesus. Now I'm disappointed. And do you know what they would say? We want to go back. Every time they hit a trial, they wanted to go back to Egypt. Why would you want to go back there? Why would you want to go back to being enslaved? Because at least there, we knew what Pharaoh wanted. We knew when we were supposed to eat, when we were supposed to drink. We at least had some control over what was happening during the day. But out here, you're just asking us to trust some cloud and fire. That's making us nervous. 
right? So many of us are struggling here because we go back to Egypt. We want to go back to being our own God. I'm going to tell you something, guys. It's easier to be your own God. You suffer a lot more, but it's just more natural because you're born that way. That's why it's natural. It's how you're born. You're born with the propensity to run your own life. Some of you are good at it. It's good at it. Some of you are horrible at it, right? But nonetheless, we need to give our life to Christ. Paul goes on to conclude, to say, So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together in unity, in the bond of peace, in the bond of love, in the bond of Jesus Christ. This morning, in a few minutes, I'm going to come down and bring the memorial table to you. But before we do that, I want us to enter into a time of examination. Some of you have already been doing it. I think that's wonderful. God thinks it's wonderful. The psalmist says to search my heart, O God. See if there's any offensive way in me. Do a careful inventory of my motives, my thoughts, my feelings. Some of you are sitting here going, man, what's the picture you have about your thoughts, feelings, and emotions? Do you have them captive? Or do they have you captive. It's one or the other. Either they have you captive and you're doing what they're telling you to do or you have them captive and once you get captive of it, now you can say no. You will submit to the Lord Jesus Christ and do whatever he says. Some of you are already concluding that this morning. So before we come, I want us to confess and pray for one another. I want us to pray for the forgiveness of sins, for healing, for restoration, for reconciliation. I want us to meet at the altar of the Lord Jesus Christ, to come and pray, that we would pray for one another. Then, and only then, we will, I'll bring the elements down and we will share together, remembering what this meal represents in our life. So we're going to enter into this time of response, and you all have on your pew, every week we're going to have this, and this is just a way, and, it, and you don't have to fill it out, but I ask that you very, at the very least, that you would read it. Just read it to yourself. In a moment, I'm going to invite you to... Just come and to pray. Some, some need to come and be prayed for. These cards, last week we had a basket, but we simply are just going to set the card right here if we fill it out. If you put your name on it, several put their name on it. Jerry, Sabrina, I can't remember who else. I want you to know we've been praying for what you put on your card, right? Sam, if you put your name on there, then you were prayed for this week. Immediately following the service, there's ladies up here that are praying over these cards. Wednesday night, they're continuing to pray for you. People through the week are, are mindful and praying for you about what you're struggling with. Right. So as you look at these cards and you see, as a, as a result of what I've heard today, I want to do the following. And if you notice, I very strategically and intentionally put on that paper, I will do nothing. Okay. Maybe you'll do nothing. Maybe you can say that. But maybe you can say, I need to change this. I need to do this. The other thing I want to be sure to invite is, there are some of you here that might be thinking, I've never, I have never said yes to Jesus. I've never acknowledged that I'm in bondage of sin. I just came to realize this morning that I'm in bondage to sin. I thought I was doing good. I just thought it was enough to go to church. I thought it was enough to participate in rituals. What I didn't realize is what this was all about. I didn't realize that it wasn't about people just gathering together and singing songs and going home or going to Denny's. I'm realizing there's more. And the more is the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the body and the blood, the Passover lamb, and that I need that to be set free from a life lived according to me. I'm realizing this morning I'm in bondage. 
your bondage may be very comfortable, but you, you have realized through the power of the Holy Spirit who's prompting you inside and telling you it may be feel good, but it's wrong. And I want to set you free from that and begin to walk a journey with you. I want to invite you to receive Jesus Christ this morning, greatest invitation you'll ever receive in your life. You may say, I've been in church 20 years, I never, don't worry about it. I tell you this all the time. There's been, we've heard stories where pastors got saved. Crazy. So I just invite you, if you've already done that, we're just going to move into a time of response. And if you want to bring your card forward, set it here. If you want to be prayed for, I invite you to come and to pray at the altars. If you want to come to light candles, we have music playing softly. I'm not inviting the worship team up on purpose so that they can participate in this response. And then I will ready us for the memorial meal. So let's just enter into a time of solitude and you responding to God.
struggling with illness. And we just want to pray for her right now. And, and if there's any others, that it's amazing that we serve a God that can do so much. It's amazing that we can have this many people in a, in a room this size. And yet only have a small handful that maybe 